Hello everyone, this is Craig Fitz with Oculus. Welcome to another Oculus webinar. We certainly thank you for attending this webinar titled Evaluating the MGD and Mybography with the Keratograph 5M. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Sruthi Srinivasan. Uh, Dr. Sruthi Srinivasan is a research assistant professor and clinical research manager at the Center for Contact Lens Research CCLR School of Optometry and Vision Science University of Waterloo, Canada. She is actively involved in various clinical trials conducted at the CCLR. Dr. Srinivasan graduated from the Elite School of Optometry in India and obtained her PhD in Vision Science from the University of Waterloo, Canada in 2008. After her PhD, Dr. Srinivasan did her postdoctoral fellowship at the Ohio State University College of Optometry. Dr. Srinivasan is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, member of the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology, and the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society. She is also serving as a scientific program committee member of the American Academy of Optometry, and she serves as a referee for several ophthalmology and optometry journals. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, please use the question box at the right of your screen. There will be an opportunity at the end of this webinar to answer your questions. Without further delay, please welcome Dr. Sruthi Srinivasan. Thank you so much, Craig. That was a nice introduction. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you to the webinar today. And in the next 45 minutes, I would like to present to you some of the new features of the Oculus K5M topographer which will enable us to visualize the mybomian glands, lids, lashes, and lipid layer appearance on the ocular surface. And let me advance the slide. Wait, it's not moving forward. Can you advance the slide, please? Okay, perfect. Uh, the outline of my talk is right up there, so I'll be talking to you about the anatomy of my Bohmian gland. I'll go over the definition of MGD, uh, about the diagnosis of MGD, and also imaging using the new K5M, uh, the, uh, the mybography and the Bohmian glands using K5M, and also the novel testing options that are available uh, in the new in the, the device. So my bonian glands are located in the tarsal plates of the upper and lower eyelid. And there are about 30 to 40 glands in the upper lid, as you can see in the picture, and about 20 to 30 glands in the lower lid. And the glands in the upper lid are longer, and the volume of my bone that they produce is more than the glands that are there in the lower lid, which are shorter, and then they produce a lower volume. And these glands are tubulo acinar holocrine glands that produce and secrete mybum. Mybum is an oily substance that aids in the stabilization of the tube. And how uh, is the mybum released? So the picture to the right you see is a cross section of a mybomian gland. The gland is uh, composed of a central duct, which is at the, at the central location you see here, right? in this area. And there are small little acini that look, looks like grapes that connect to the central duct via the duct tubes that you see here. So there are mybocytes that are located in the acini. And these mybocytes disintegrate. And then they release mybum into the central duct via the duct tubes. And then the mybum is released out of the orifice. And this process happens when the blink occurs. So the eyelid closure uh, contracts the orbicularis oculus muscle. And then the mybum is expressed out. And it is spread when a blink happens. So whenever there's a blink that happens, the mybum that's uh, secreted is uh, spread nicely over the ocular surface. And the orifices are normally seen in the mid margin at the mucocutaneous junction. And you can visualize them by gently pulling the lower lid or upper lid away from the globe. And the mybum can be expressed by gently putting pressure uh, on the eyelid margin, and you'll be able to see the secretions. And mybum is normally supposed to be having a cooking oil, uh, nice uh, gold color appearance. And this fluid easily spreads over the 
surface of the chia film and it forms the outermost layer of the chia film. A healthy mybum is necessary for maintaining a healthy ocular surface. By that I mean the right consistency and color, quality and quantity is essential for maintaining a healthy ocular surface. And mybum itself has several different functions. So when the mybum spreads over the ocular surface, it forms the lipid layer and which is the outermost layer of the tear film, which and it prevents the underlying layers, the aqueous layer and the mucin layer from drying out. So it's mainly the function of lipid layers to slow evaporation of the aqueous tear components. And also it enhances the tear film spreading and stability. It also prevents the spillover of tears from the lid margin and to close the, of course, the lid margins during sleep and also provides a smooth optical surface uh, allowing us for uh, having good optimal vision. So what happens in mybomian gland dysfunction? It's one of the most common conditions that we notice. As a clinician, I'm sure, a clinician sitting uh, and listening to me, you would definitely agree with me that it is a very common condition that you notice. And it's one of the major causes of evaporative dry eye. So what happens in this condition is that there is a change in color and consistency of the mybum that's present. So usually, as I, as I was mentioned to you, the mybum is supposed to be nice gold and cooking oil appearance color. It starts to change to more into yellow color shades, as well as the consistency moves from liquid to more thick toothpaste consistency like um, uh, mybum, which is what is noted in severe forms of MGD. And MGD is characterized by inflammatory changes at the lip margin and changes in the anatomy of the orifices as well. And all of these things ultimately lead to ocular surface disease. So there is loss of lubrication and damage to the ocular surface. And I'll be talking in depth about it during this presentation. A group of experts got together. Uh, and in 2011, there was a um, mybomian gland workshop that was conducted where various experts, clinicians, researchers got together and they studied about the uh, clinical studies and the research that published in this area of research and came up with definition, classification, how to treat the condition. So it's a, it's a nice reading material if uh, you're not, you, if you were not exposed to it already. It's called the Mybomian Gland Workshop Report and it uh, was published in IOBS as a special issue. It's a great reading material. Uh, to understand about this condition. And in one of the chapters, it was described that mybomian gland dysfunction may well be one of the leading causes of dry eye throughout the world. So it is as simple as dealing with the lid issues, which would help you know, with many people having um, dry eye conditions. So it would be uh, as simple as treating uh, lid conditions like MGD, giving them warm compressors, and asking them to clean the lids, which will definitely help them with their online dry eye, uh, which is prevalent. And this slide is the definition of mybomian gland dysfunction. Again, this was this is from the report of the International Workshop on MGD. So MGD is a chronic diffuse abnormality of the mybomian glands, commonly characterized by terminal duct gland obstruction and or qualitative or quantitative changes in the granular secretion, and this may result in alteration of the tear film, cause symptoms of dry uh, of ir eye irritation, clinically apparent inflammation, and ocular surface disease. And this is a new classification system, which was uh, proposed by the International Workshop or, on MGD, uh, which distinguishes among the subgroups of MGD on the basis of the level of secretion and further subdivides those categories by potential consequences and manifestations. On the basis of these proposed classification, obstructive MGD is the most pervasive. So you can see that here the obstructive MGD um, is the most pervasive and it leads to ocular surface disease. Uh, Classification of MGD is done in several ways. Um, one of the classification systems that I've put up there is uh, between the non-obvious MGD and classic and obvious MGD. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have heard about non-obvious MGD 
Uh, it was uh, recently published, uh, this condition is recently published by uh, Don Korb, uh, researcher in the field of Marbonian gland dysfunction, where uh, he defines this condition as a precursor to, uh, to full-blown MGD. So the classic and obvious MGD, you know, the signs are, uh, are very obvious in terms of inflammation in the lid margin, there could be infection, there could be blood glands, insipated material, in the blood glands and also you could see uh, hypremia of the lid margin, whereas non-obvious MGD is a condition where you'd find that the signs are not very clear. You would not be noticing any hypremia on the lid margin or any obvious signs, and there, but there could be stasis of the uh, secretion which may cause symptoms in these people. And then this could act as a precursor to the obvious MGD. And in one of the very recent publications, it was found that uh, uh, about 48% of people uh, who were examined in the study had non-obvious MGD. And as I was mentioning to you, it is a precursor of obvious MGD. And this ultimately, again, leads to alteration of the cheerful rotation of the eyes and inflammation in ocular surface disease. This is a picture that I took from the uh, MGD workshop. Uh, this just shows us the different stages of uh, MGD. So the gland, the orifice that is present here, when it gets blocked because of the hyperkeratinization of the epithelium of the lid margin, it may obstruct the orifice here, and it will prevent the secretions, the myobum secretions, to freely come out of the orifice. And it starts to build up, and it slowly increases the size of the central duct. You can see that the size of the central duct, the width is increasing, and you can see the ACNI are slowly shrinking. And this can finally lead to uh, atrophy of the ACNI that you see here. So the oil gets buttered up, and it doesn't come out, and it becomes so thick that it has no way to get out, and then finally it lands atrophy. So this is the, the sequence of MGD. And uh, even in contact lens where uh, people complain of uh, discomfort, and it could be because of the blockage of myobomian glands. And when myobomian gland disease is untreated, it can lead to serious discomfort. So decrease, what happens is when the glands get obstructed, there is a decrease in lipid secretion, and also the lipid layer thickness uh, decreases significantly, and this increases the evaporation of the underlying aqueous uh, layer of the tear film, and it can exponentially increase. It can, it can go up from 4 times to 16 times, and this can decrease the liquid layer thickness, hence leading to an unstable tear film, and that leads to symptoms and discomfort and dryness, of course. So this is the typical dry eye cascade which occurs due to untreated myobomian gland dysfunction. So I've talked about uh, myobomian gland dysfunction. Now I would like to move on to the diagnosis of MGD. Uh, the very first thing that we always um, ask our patients is uh, detailed history. So we ask about the symptoms. And since uh, MGD and dry are symptom-driven disease, you find that uh, patients normally complain of burning, stinging, tiredness, uh, foreign body sensation, that could be also complaints of scratchiness, quickness, dryness, and also contact lens wears complain of awareness of each blink. So the, there are different questionnaires that are available to capture these symptoms, and the best way of capturing symptoms is to use some of these validated questionnaires, and the reason being um, you get a documentation of what their symptoms are when, the, when you review them for the first time and when you treat them and you call them back uh, for your follow-up visit. A questionnaire would be very handy to administer during both occasions and see if there is an uh, improvement in, your, in the treatment that you have provided to your patients. So some of these questionnaires are very easy to ad administer and there is a ton of questionnaires that are available. I've just given two examples here. One is the OSDI questionnaire, which is a 12-item questionnaire. It has a score, that, a formula that helps you to compute the scores right away. And uh, I have uh, detailed the scoring pattern for normal, smiles, moderate, and severe. So you can group them based on the scores that you obtained from 
uh, these patients. And also um, for contact lens wearers, there is a contact lens dry eye questionnaire that's available. And the of this questionnaire is that it captures the diurnal variation of symptoms. So you can capture uh, their symptoms in the morning, afternoon, and evening and see when there is a peak, uh, if there is any peaking of um, symptoms noticed during the evenings or late evenings and so on. So questionnaires are the best way to go and also it helps you to monitor your treatment uh, and also it will let you know if it works or not and if symptomatically if your patients are getting better or not. And when it comes to my bony and gland evaluation, uh, the first step is to do a routine evaluation of lid, uh, lids and lid margin, which you can do it with a slit lamp. Uh, it starts with uh, looking at the uh, lid, um, lashes and the lid margins to grade the lid margins for redness and also assess, assess the lashes for debris and if there are any colorets and so on. So that's, and if there is any lash loss. So that's the first step. And I will be talking more about this uh, aspect because the K5M, the Keratograph 5M, has an imaging uh, option which helps you to capture images of the lids lid margin of the lashes so that you can follow your patients to find out if there is any lash loss happening, especially in severe cases of uh, MGD and blepharitis. Cases if you want to follow them up, that would be a great tool to take images and I will be talking about uh, that shortly. And also monitoring the quality and quantity of my bum, uh, which is the very imp one of the very important aspects of my bony and gland evaluation. Uh, again, um, this can be easily done used by using a slit lamp where you can put pressure in the lower and upper lid margins to see how the glands are secreting. And the next couple of slides uh, I'll be talking about uh, staging the secretions based on the appearance of the secretion and also uh, the color and consistency. So it's important to look at the capping of mabomian glands, mabomian gland expression and the quality of mabomian gland secretion. And mybomian gland functionality assessment is also another aspect which I'll be talking to you shortly. An assessment of lipid layer uh, of the tear film. Uh, again, this can be done using the new K5. And uh, in the next couple of slides, I'll be talking in detail about that. And mybography. Mybography is a very interesting feature uh, which is in this new K5. And uh, the ease of use and the stepwise procedures I will be discussing in the next couple of slides. So quality of my bum. Um, as clinicians, we normally look at the central eight glands. Um, and it's been done for years. And I personally look for the central as well as the uh, temporal glands and the nasal glands as well. But uh, in future, many researchers have chosen the central eight glands just for the ease of uh, reviewing it. Because uh, when you go more temporally, it's hard to express the glands. And, visualize them. And uh, when it comes to upper lid, not too many clinicians do that, but I think it's very important for us to look uh, at the uh, secretions uh, of the upper lid as well because um, there are glands that get blocked in the upper lid and they go unnoticed and that can cause symptoms as well. So uh, the scoring uh, range is between 0 to 24. And that comes from a scale that we use, which is a 0 to 3 scale, and where 0 refers to clear secretion. So when you put pressure in the lower lid and you look for the secretions and there is clear secretions, then we give it a scale of 0. And if the secretions are going to be cloudy, then you can give a score of 1. If there is more debris present uh, along with the cloudiness, then you can give a score of 2. And if the secretion is more toothpaste-like and it doesn't um, uh, express, um, and it has non-expressible material in it, then you can give a score of three. And this is a good uh, scoring scheme. And whenever you give treatment to your patients and they come back for a follow-up and you review the secretions, you'll be able to see that um, based on this scoring scheme, if there is any change in, your, um, in, the, in the secretions after you've provided treatment. And the next uh, ex next um, aspect of measurement is the mabomian gland expressibility. And again, it can be assessed on a 0 to 3 scale. And you can uh, assess the central eight glands or five glands. Uh, that's absolutely fine. And then uh, according to the number of glands expressible, you can give the grade from 0 to 3 as described in the slide. 
And another method of expressing my, my bonance is using a Q-tip and a Mastroda paddle, as you can see in this picture. Or you can use uh, just digital expression to see how the glands express. And moving on to the main topic of today, my dog B. Uh, the pictures that you see in this uh, slide uh, show different grades of uh, meibomian gland dropout. When we say meibomian gland dropout, that simply means the loss of meibomian glands. So you can see that the picture to, to the right, the glands are nice and parallel. Some of them have uh, tortuosity. And this particular image is obtained uh, using infrared uh, light. And my biography, the term means that it's visualization of meibomian gland structures. Um, so it can be achieved by different methods. Uh, and the um, illumination system that is used in the Cartograph 5 is uh, infrared. And this image was captured using a Cartograph 5 um, instrument. And you can see that the glands are nice and long, and some are parallel, and some ha are having a little bit of tortuosity in it. And uh, the lower and upper lids can be really inverted, and using the infrared illumination, you can capture images. So the one here that you see is the image of the lower lid. The one that here you see is the image of the upper lid. And uh, the, gland, the eyelid pictures that are at the bottom, you can see that some of the glands are missing here in this, and some you can barely see the glands. And this is of the upper lid. And this is the lower lid. Again, you can see some white patchy areas. And then there is a huge amount of um, uh, area here where the glands are missing. And that is termed as dropout. So if you hear someone say that it is gland dropout, that's all it means. That it could be a complete gland dropout where the gland completely is uh, missing. Or it could be a partial dropout where you can see that there is glands that are partially present and half of the gland is missing here. So it could be complete or partial uh, loss of glands. And these images also help us to find out if there's any tortuosity present in the meibomian glands, although researchers are investigating what those tortuosity, tortuous paths of those glands mean. Uh, this is quite common and we find uh, tortuous glands in many, many people. And we're still uh, finding out what do they actually mean. And also this is a uh, these images will help us to show how long each of these glands are. How, or, um, and there is also studies that support the fact that uh, uh, contact lenses may uh, cause uh, shortening of uh, glands. There's a couple of publications out there. So again, that warrants further investigation. But those are the things that we can study uh, using the mybography. As well as um, uh, from a clinician's perspective, you would want to uh, explain to your patients. You want to tell them how your, the glands look like. It's easy for you to uh, tell them that I'm going to put some pressure in your lower lid and see for expressions. And there are tiny glands in your uh, upper and lower lid that open up and they produce oil. But if you show them a picture to show how these glands look, they'd be able to understand even better. And if you tell them that the symptoms are because you are uh, having a dropout or you're having uh, missing glands in certain sections. It's a great educational tool uh, for your patients. And when you're giving treatment, you can also follow up and find out if there is any difference that you notice in the glandular structures. So the earlier methods of mybography were more invasive, and it was meant to be a researcher's tool. And uh, mostly the lower lids were able to be uh, imaged. And it was quite an invasive procedure. But the current methods normally use infrared uh, light source. And there are um, other instruments other than the Keratograph 5 uh, that also offers mybography. Uh, there is a slit lamp uh, tool, which is attached with an infrared transmitting filter, which is attached to a camera. So that instrument is also available to image the meibomian glands. And then some researchers have uh, adapted uh, security cameras near, uh, I mean, it's a security camera which has got infrared uh, light in it. So they've adapted that for um, imaging the meibomian glands. Again, this is more of a research tool. And these devices are capable of imaging uh, these glands. We're able to take images and views. And both upper and lower lids can be imaged using these glands as well, these uh, uh, um, instruments. 
So now I'm going to be talking about the Keratograph 5M and its features, the new features, and also showing more light to my biography and how we're going to uh, capture my biography images using this particular device. So Keratograph 5, I've been using it for the past couple of years and it has got various features. So it's not only a topographer, but it has other additional features uh, which allow us to take images of the lipid layer. It can measure uh, tear film in terms of tear film breakup time, tear meniscus height, uh, and also there is a um, infrared option in it which allows my biography. And the blue LED spots allow us to visualize uh, when there's fluorescein administered in the eye, so you can also evaluate lens fit. And then there is white light LED spots which are available to evaluate how the tears spread over the ocular surface. And it's a topographer, so uh, uh, one of its main functions is to provide topography as well. So these are some of the cool features that are available in the device. So it's, it's a, it's a one-stop shop for all of these uh, uh, measurements. Um, so moving to my biography in particular. So um, when we invert the upper and lower lids, it's as simple as using a Q-tip to hold them in place. And when you capture an image using the K5, this is how it looks like. So you can see that the, uh, there is an image, infrared image, as well as it's almost like a binarized version of the image where you can see the glands even uh, much clearer. It's a magnified view. And then you also notice the uh, ACNR structures quite well. And it uh, helps you to uh, categorize or grade the meibomian gland dropout uh, in your patients. So it's very easy. Flip the upper lid and flip the lower lid and you can take the images. And as I was mentioning to you, you can see the nice parallel structures here. And it shows that there's no gland dropout in this person. And that's the lower lid. Again, you can see the nice parallel structures here and no dropout. Whereas, in this person, you can see that there's hardly any glands visible here. And also in the lower lid, there is a lot of loss noticed. And that is obvious when the image is uh, magnified and also binarized. You see that there are no nice, we don't notice any, any more parallel structures of the, of the meibomian glands. So I want to quickly walk you through the procedures of obtaining meibomian gland images. Um, so the keratograph is attached to a computer, and the screen would have a, an icon uh, called Oculus Keratograph. So you double click on the icon, that will open up a patient, new patient uh, entry where you can enter the last name, first name, and date of birth. This is essential for us to go to the next step. And that will take you to a page, called, page with a keratograph uh, logo on it, so, and also you can um, click examination and enter new that will open up this panel where to the left you see all the different tests that are available and in this particular window I have clicked uh, my biography upper and lower lid and this opens up this window with a red uh, box for visualization and focusing of uh, the upper or lower lid uh, of interest and once we position the patient comfortably, um, we can capture images of the upper and lower lid. Let's see. So the position is the patient is positioned here, and um, the infrared option can be clicked, and then we notice. So you can see that the patient is positioned, and I've used usually use a cotton tip applicator to retract the lower lid and upper lid away from the globe for easy image capture. So you can pick the option of upper lid or lower lid, um, and then you can capture the images. So this is how uh, the image capture screen looks like. So after you've captured the upper and lower lid images, you'll notice that the uh, infrared image is given to the right and the binarized version is given to the left. And you can, this particular patient, you can notice that there are harsh glands, there are the gland dropout in this area, as well as in the lower lip. You can, you see that there are some glands missing in this region. And um, 
uh, this image uh, takes, capturing this image takes about less than a minute per eye, so it's very easy to capture. And um, um, you may need help or assistance in folding the upper lid, but uh, with practice it shouldn't be a problem at all. So all that you need is to invert the lid and hold it in place and uh, ask your patient to look down when uh, the upper lid image is being captured and ask your patient to look up when the image of the lower lid is captured. Moving on to the next slide. So this uh, in slide shows the different grades that are given for Mabomian gland dropout. This is based on a research paper that uh, Arita et al. Um, described in 2008. Um, the gland dropout can be classified as grade 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, depending on the amount of uh, dropout. So grade 0, the one that you see in the top, uh, there's no dropout, there's no loss of glands in both upper and lower lid that you see up there. So uh, it is given a grade 0. If there is 33% uh, or less gland loss, then in that case, uh, the grade scheme that's given is grade 1. And if the gland loss is about 33% to 67%, then the grading scheme is 2. And if the loss is greater than 67%, then it's grade 3. I hope you can see the um, loss of glands in grade 2 and grade 3 more clearly. And uh, grade 1, not so much. You can see there's very minimal gland loss. And grade 0, there's absolutely no gland loss. So the advantages of using Keratograph 5M in taking mabography images is that if you can successfully take images of the upper and lower lid, and it's non-contact. It, you don't have to explain anything extra to your patient because inversion of upper and lower eyelid is very common, and it's a routine uh, part of an eye exam. So it's nothing um, unusual or different from your procedures that you normally do. And also, uh, there's no poking or prodding or touching of this device with the, uh, or it doesn't even come in contact with the ocular surface, so it's totally non-contact, non-invasive, and the time taken to capture mybography images is less than a minute per eye, so it's very quick, and it's also user-friendly, and as I was mentioning to you, it's, a, it's it, the single device offers so many different uh, testing options. So um, it is very easy for you to scan the tear film as well as to take mybography images and explain to your patients. Um, I would not be going in depth uh, regarding topography and pupillometry because um, uh, topography, uh, would, it's a standard feature and uh, it, you, know, you must be knowing more about topography, but I would like to focus more on the tear film scanning options the redness option, uh, mybography scanning option, and imaging option that the K5 offers. So in addition to the mybography uh, feature, there is also an imaging uh, option that the device provides, which helps us to capture images of the uh, upper and lower lids. Uh, you can look for redness, you can look for lash loss, and you can also get an overview of the appearance of the lids, the upper and lower lids. And um, uh, imaging function, again, you can choose the option from the left panel here. All of the test options that I've been talking to you is all available in this section. Excuse me. And uh, the image option is right at the bottom here. And, uh, the in magnification can be changed. Uh, you can choose uh, different options which are avail available in the right hand side of the panel. So if there's 1, 1 1.4, 2, uh, and so on. So uh, the infrared option also helps us to capture images without um, reflex tearing, which I'll be talking to you more about when it comes to tear film function. So uh, this option also offers us to um, Visualize the lipid layers. Tear film scan offers us to uh, look at the lipid layer of the tear film. So here is a video that we have captured 
which shows a thin lipid layer. So you can see that the color of the lipid layer is more uh, brown and bronze color. So that shows that it um, lacks, uh, the tear film lacks the lipid layer. So that's a good example of thin lipid layer. And here's an example of thick lipid layer obtained this device. So you can see that the colors are more vivid and the mybum is spreading nicely across the um, tear film. And also you can change the magnification to have a closer view, a uh, close-up uh, close view of uh, the lipid layer here. And again, as I already mentioned to you, there are different functions uh, that the lipid layer offers. The main function being it uh, helps the underlying layer from evaporation and also acts as a lubricant to prevent friction between the eyelids and the ocular surface. It's a very smooth refractive surface for a good optical quality. And um, this device has the high resolution camera so that uh, you, the images that you just saw, the videos that you just saw, uh, they were all captured with a high resolution color camera so we could see all the colors vividly. And also when it comes to redness assessments, we can see that uh, uh, the uh, blood vessels are clearly seen. And also when you image the lids, you will be able to notice uh, that the resolution of the camera is really high and it caps captures high quality images. Uh, there are options in terms of magnification. So uh, as we all know, we need different field of view and different working distance ranges depending on what we are looking at. So for uh, topography measurements, for the redness measurements, and for uh, tear film scan, each of them require different uh, field of view and uh, working distance uh, requirements. So for MIBO scan redness measurements, we need a wider field of view. So in order for us to capture the full uh, uh, length of the lids and the eyes. And if it's um, just the um, topography measurements, then the field of view is slightly lesser. And if we're going to assess the tear film, scan, tear film uh, layer, again, it depends if we want to go up close to look at it, it's going to be a different field of view when working distance as opposed to um, having a, um, a closer view than a farther away view. So this device offers uh, all of these um, different field of view um, as well as working distance options as well. Another uh, interesting feature that the device offers is the uh, tear film scan which allows us to assess the tear meniscus height uh, using both infrared as well as white light assessment. So the infrared option helps uh, or prevents the patients from tearing up. So we can we often almost notice that when there is bright light, even the light from the slit lamp, when we uh, shine that in the patient's eye, uh, there could be uh, excessive tearing happening. So which may uh, not, which may restrict us, us from capturing the tear meniscus height appropriately. So this instrument has an option of using infrared which avoids or which um, prevents the tearing and hence you can get a real value or a neat clean value of tear meniscus height. So there are again different options in terms of field of view. So you can see, get an overall view of how the tear meniscus uh, is for in your patients as well as if you want to go close up to see uh, how the tear from um, height is there is an option of using a ruler which helps us to capture the height of the tear meniscus. So it is very simple. So you put the cursor in the top uh, of meniscus and then place the uh, lower end of the ruler closer to the lower lid and this will give us the tear meniscus height. So again, the different magnifications allow us to capture the uh, details very carefully. So you can get an overall view as well as a close-up view. And we can measure the tear meniscus height very easily. And it's as simple as capturing a picture. You can save the picture. You can come back to the picture and measure it again. 
So it's it's very simple. The key is to capture a nice clear image of the lower uh, uh, tear meniscus, and you can always go back to it and assess the tear meniscus height. So uh, it's a great tool when uh, again you're providing treatment to your patients and you want to review them and see if there is a change in the tear meniscus height. This instrument is wonderful in terms of capturing tear meniscus height before and after treatment. And as I mentioned to you, the infrared conditions uh, are very helpful and conducive for measuring tear meniscus height because it prevents the patients, your patients from tearing. And you would notice that there is NIK-TBOT. K is simply meant for keratograph, so uh, non-invasive tear breakup time, a tear meniscus head, excuse me. Uh, but K here refers to keratograph, so it's non-invasive uh, keratograph tear meniscus height measurement. And the next feature that the tear scan um, uh, mode offers is the non-invasive tear breakup time, and again NIK-TBUT or NIK-BUT refers to non-invasive keratograph breakup time. So um, this instrument captures the area of tear breakup. It also captures the uh, first area of tear breakup, gives us the average tear breakup time, and it gives us this nice map or the color map where there are cool colors and warm colors. So the reds refer to shorter tear breakup time regions and the green refers to more um, uh, clear areas without breakup. And this, heat, this color map helps to identify the area of breakup and you would be able to see real time where the first area of breakup is and um, also follow up to see where how the breakup pattern happens. So this um, feature again uh, it's available in infrared as well, so you need not capture the image in bright white light because that may cause more tearing or uh, maybe disturb disturbing to the patients. So infrared option helps us to uh, capture this measurement uh, with ease. And uh, as I mentioned to you, this measurement can be done under infrared lighting conditions as well. Uh, the tear current dynamics can also be obtained using this device. So the tear film movement, uh, the slower the movement, it is associated with a, a nice thick lipid layer and uh, that's associated with a, a more viscous tear film, whereas more la rapid, faster movement, which is uh, mostly negatively correlated with the tear film thickness and viscosity. So that's another measurement that we can look at. We can look at the tear particle movement and how the tear, tear movement is with each ring. And depending on this movement, we can determine uh, the thickness of the, the tear film lipid layer. That's another interesting feature that this device offers. Um, the next feature that I'm going to be talking to you about is the R scan or the redness uh, scan. Mm, there are different conditions that can cause redness in the eyes, allergies, NGD, blepharitis, and I'll be talking about more conditions in the next slide which can cause redness. And uh, there should be a nice way to monitor redness because for some it increases over the course of the day. Contact lens wear can increase redness. So that if we have a nice metric to capture or a nice method to capture this redness and um, give us a score, uh, there are different scales that are available uh, which you can subjectively assess the redness. But this device objectively gives us redness values and we can assess the temporal and nasal bulbar tendon curva as well as temporal and nasal limbal regions. So this device gives us a redness value and it assesses the total area of redness measured as well as the um, redness of the um, bulbar conjunctiva in total. And uh, the only thing that I wanted to mention here is that this bulbar redness uh, measurement is not in a FDA approved uh, uh, measurement right now in the U.S. at this time and not uh, it's not being able to release uh, on the K5M but soon after 
CFP approval uh, would be available and released. But it's a cool feature where we can assess the redness um, again with treatment. We can see before and after treatment uh, if there's any changes to the redness and also to find out uh, contact lens wears uh, between morning and evening or over the course of two weeks of lens wear if there's any change in redness measurements. So uh, normally we notice redness in a whole bunch of uh, uh, ocular conditions including NGD, blepharitis, conjunctivitis, contact lens wear, cosmetic use, extension, diabetes, and for uh, other drug uh, usage as well. And grading scales, as I mentioned to you, are um, available, um, subjective grading scales, but this device uh, is, um, will offer us objective measurements of redness, and it will be nice to monitor redness in your patients using this device. Um, so this tool is wonderful in terms of determining, uh, examining MGD and dry eye. So there's a whole bunch of uh, analysis that we can do as well as uh, eyelid uh, photography and mybography measurements can also be obtained. So there are various different analysis tools that are available including the redness scan, tear meniscus height measurement, tear particle movement, mybography, lipid layer measurements, and tear breakup time measurements. And the best part is the non-invasive tear breakup measurement here is that in a clinical setup, we'll be administering fluorescein and asking the patients to blink a few times and assess the tear breakup time, whereas all these measurements are non-invasive. So you have to measure the dye more. Uh, it's a non-invasive real-time measurement. And uh, all these measurements are very helpful in terms of determining um, if there is any reduction in the tear uh, quality, uh, quantity, and we can classify them based on uh, increased tear evaporation if you notice that, or if there's a decrease in tear film, um, tear meniscus height. So this device is offers, it's a one-stop uh, shop for all these measurements. And once you determine your values, uh, you can always target your treatment based on what values you obtain in terms of TMS, tear break of time, mammography values, and so on. So it is um, uh, a great device for us to determine all of these measurements. And this device in particular I was talking to you is multifunctional and um, there are different features that are present in this one device and the tear scan is meant for qualitative and quantitative tear film assessment. The MIBO scan is meant for mybomian gland assessment. And the redness scan is meant for automatic redness uh, you know, measurement for the bulbar and the limbal uh, redness measurements. And also the imaging software is available to uh, capture images of the cornea, lids, lashes, and also we can capture images of contact lens over the eye to capture how it moves or how it uh, dries uh, as well. And also it is non-contact, non-invasive, and there it's a documentation. You can always go back and look for what values you got. You can always compare with pre and post treatment. And also it's a great tool for education. You can teach your patients and um, it's always easier to show them images and pictures of their own eye because we always teach patients, we show them pictures, but then when you talk about their own eye and show them pictures of their own eye to explain their condition, it, it helps them to comprehend their eye problems. And as a practitioner, you have more satisfaction that um, you were able to send the message across to them. It's so much easier to uh, show them numbers and show them images. And also, it is one place which has so many interesting options. So the main key take-home messages from, um, from this uh, talk is that we have to make sure that um, we obtain a good, careful history, because um, his carefully listening to your patients, you will be able to uh, come up with so many uh, uh, treatment options and also diagnosing the problem, right? And in addition to that, um, if you have careful methods of documentation and all the tests that are available, if you use them carefully, 
it would be useful for, for you to create them and change the condition of the uh, meibomian gland dysfunction or dry eye appropriately and treat the patients accordingly. And also devices such as K5 help us to um, capture photographs, videos of the existing conditions, um, eye conditions as well as presence of contact lenses and um, capturing how the tears are, the lipid layer, how the um, uh, tear breakup time is. And this would be very helpful for us to uh, monitor, uh, group them in a specific category of dry eye and also treat them appropriately. And then um, regular follow-ups is absolutely necessary. And also you have to be aware of novel te testing options that are available and devices that are out there and upgrades that need to be done. And also this helps you to, as, as, a, as an eye care provider, you can um, talk to your patients and then uh, establish that uh, uh, sort of a loyalty. So your patients will be happy to listen to you when you show them examples and show them uh, images of their own eyelids and um, follow them. When you follow them up, you can show them that this is how your condition was when you started this treatment and this is how it is now. And I think that would be a great tool for education as well. And as I've been mentioning to you from the first, it's one device which offers several testing options. So um, you can have the, each patient and have them in the database and then have the list of tests under uh, each of these patients and then you can go back to it and review it easily. So it's very easy and it's, a, uh, it's one device which offers so many different uh, features and especially the new cool features such as my biography feature and the tear scan feature will be very helpful. Uh, in your clinic, especially if you have a dry eye clinic, it's so much, it's, it's a tool that uh, every clinician would like to have. I think that's all I have in my presentation. I'd be very happy to take any questions if uh, you have. Dr. Srinivasan, thank you very much. That was a great educational presentation. Really appreciate that. Um, there are a few questions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please use the um, the box on the right-hand side of your screen and type those questions in. We're going to answer questions for about another 10 minutes here, if you have any at all. There is one that I'd like to ask. Uh, do the mybo glands begin to drop out nasally first, or is it sort of random? Because notice, I noticed that you had a couple of images there where the nasal was dropping out first before anywhere else. Actually, that is a very, very good question. Uh, some of the papers that have been um, presented in the literature show that the nasal glands secrete more mybum than any other uh, region. So if that is the case, then the nasal dropout should not be happening first. But I think uh, anatomically, the nasal uh, glands may be buried underneath and you don't see it as much. But um, uh, we also notice the same thing. We notice that the nasal glands uh, seem to disappear first, but although it contradicts the um, articles that are out there which talk about nasal glands secreting more myelin, so yeah. Thank you. Uh, another question in regards to that is, do the glands begin to drop out in the upper or the lower lids first? Uh, there is nothing uh, uh, in the literature that says that the upper lid drops out first or the lower lid drops out first. It's just that it depends on the uh, you know, health of the glands and it, the, for, I've seen people who are over 60 but still have glands that are intact and all, but they may show a few glands that are blocked and maybe when you put some pressure in the lower lid upper lid you see that the uh, glands are still expressing. So it's not that uh, it, it's mandatory that the upper lid loses, goes off first and the lower lid follows after this, there's nothing like that. So it totally depends on your health and uh, there is no such, uh, no concrete answer for your question to say yes, this one loses, the upper lid loses first, followed by the lower lid, no, there's nothing like that. Thank you very much. Um, another question we have here is uh, how far from the margin should you evaluate the MGs? Uh, from the margins, usually central eight glands is what uh, typically is given in the literature. But personally, I would say it is good to look at all the glands 
And also the temporal and the nasal are very, very important too. So it's just not only the central. Sometimes you'll notice that the central glands may be functioning perfectly fine. It could be a couple of glands in the temporal region. Uh, although literature suggests central eight, as a clinician, I would go through all the glands to see how they are functioning. Okay, thank you. Another question, what is your recommendation for treatments of MGD from mild to severe? Uh, I would follow the MGD um, workshop that they've staged, they've asked us to stage the disease in, uh, into four categories. So stage one, two, three, and four. So I would recommend um, uh, the attendees today to uh, review the IOVS special issue, which was which is it's actually freely available online. It's March 2011, and it's volume 52, number four uh, issue, and it's um, an IOVS uh, publication. And um, typically, uh, the reason why I, I recommend this is because this treatment algorithm was um, uh, obtained based on all the research uh, that was done uh, you know, all these years and also it was from a panel of uh, uh, experts uh, that got together. So basically you can stage the stage MGD as 1, 2, 3, 4 and plus disease and then you can treat them based on which stage they belong to. So say for example if it's stage 1 where there is a uh, no symptoms, but then there is minimal clinical science, then we can uh, inform them, uh, inform the patients about the presence of MGD and also um, them to change, change their diet a little bit and also uh, take care of the env environment that they are working in and uh, see if, there is, if the environment is too dry and explain to them that uh, they have to drink lots of water and also follow lid hygiene, such as, you know, do warm compressors and expressions as well. And if it's stage two with minimal symptoms and signs, then in addition to whatever I mentioned, uh, we can recommend uh, eyelid hygiene and also um, lid um, uh, warm compressors as well and some artificial tears. And if need be, if there is staining, we can give some uh, topical azithromycin uh, as well. And if it's stage three with moderate symptoms and moderate clinical signs, all of the above that I mentioned, as well as some oral tetracycline, derivatives, lubricant ointments at that time, and anti-inflammatory therapy. And if it's going to be stage four with marked symptoms and marked clinical signs, uh, then all of the all of the uh, treatment uh, that I mentioned, as well as some anti-inflammatory therapy for dry eye. And plus diseases are totally different. We uh, plus diseases include chalazion and uh, severe demodex and so on. So that has to be treated in a different way. Yeah. So I would recommend the treatment algorithm that the MGD workshop recommends. Thank you. Uh, another one based upon that question you just answered is: there any evidence of omega three benefit? Uh, that's a very very good question. I am on omega threes. And I noticed that the literature uh, has uh, different kinds of reports. Some studies say there is no change, and some studies that do say there is a change. So uh, as of now, um, as an optometrist, I, I would recommend omega-3s just for the fact that it is anti-inflammatory and it would be beneficial. It's a, it's a holistic approach. It's good for your body as such. So omega-3s, even though there is not much of a literature supporting one way, it doesn't hurt. It's absolutely all right to have omega-3s. So that's fine. Thank you. Um, are women more likely to have MGD due to makeup? Um, the thing is, um, women, no, we notice that women uh, complain of dry eye and the prevalence of dry eye in women is more than men. And the point about makeup is, is a valid one because we find that uh, uh, when makeup is not properly removed uh, at the end of the day or when it's, when it's before bedtime, we find that people do um, complain of more dryness because the makeup could clog the pores up to clog the orifices. So um, it's definitely important for us to emphasize to our patients that if you use eye makeup, especially have heavy eye makeup, it has to be removed. Uh, Makeup room even avoid um, blockage of 
the order of this. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, another question here, can you use an anesthetic for a nick butt test to see how the tear film breaks up without a patient blink? Um, so uh, again, a great question. So the device uh, asks you to keep your eyes open for as long as you can. Typically, it's about 25 seconds. Uh, what, what I recommend is um, for us to get a real-time uh, value of what the tear breakup time is, it would be best to determine without any anesthetic drops in the eye. So that will give us the, um, the true value of uh, tear breakup uh, time measurement. So I would prefer for us to do um, nick butt measurements without anesthetic. Thank you. Uh, can the dropped out meibomian gland areas be regenerated through heat therapy treatments? Great question. Again, we don't know. We don't know if um, the atrophied glands come back because if there is inflammation happening in the uh, tarsal plate, uh, if there is a lot of uh, fluid accumulation, infrared doesn't pass through. So when we when we take an image of the uh, meibomian glands when the lids are swollen, sometimes you may not get the information uh, properly because a um, layer of uh, liquid and inflammation, if it's going on in, the, in that area, that can obscure some information of some meibomian glands. So what I find is, um, personally, I've had um, uh, chalazions and I've had the uh, removal. So I've my big work and then once I had chalazion and had it removed, now I find that that area doesn't show any, any meibomian glands at all. But then, um, but soon after the surgery, I noticed that I couldn't notice any of the adjacent glands as well. That was because of a lot of accumulation of you know, fluid and inflammation going on there. But once the, um, after a few days after surgery, I could see the glands that were closer to the surgery area that I could see again. So we have to be very careful when we interpret the mammography uh, images. If, if there is any inflammation going on or anything that obscures the infrared from capturing the mammobian glands, we may lose some information there. So that's something that I wanted to mention. And also glands that atrophy, um, that drop out, we don't know if it will come back. But that's, that's something that the researchers are studying right now. Thank you very much. Um, is there any type of device to measure blink frequency and duration? And what is the importance of the blink frequency and duration? Blink frequency and duration uh, right now, um, from a clinician's perspective, there's uh, not, uh, the, um, the best of my knowledge, I don't think there is anything that is available, but um, blink frequency is extremely important, and uh, the reason being, blink action is the is the one that spreads the lipid layer uh, on over the the tear film. So we have to make sure that we blink regularly. That's something that we all fail to. We work in front of computers, and we're always in front of gadgets, so we forget to blink, and. Uh, what happens is the, the myobum that's supposed to be expelled and spread over the lipid layer, over the sorry, excuse me, tear film, doesn't happen effectively. So I think the best way to remember to blink is put a little sign next to your computer to say blink regularly. <laughs> but as of now, I don't think there is anything for clinicians um, to measure blink. But for researchers, for sure, there are many, many devices that uh, you can uh, come up with to evaluate and monitor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shruti Srinivasan, thank you very, very much for your uh, presentation this evening. We are out of time and um, on behalf of Oculus and the attendees, we'd like to thank you very much for your time and the educational webinar you have shared with us. We look forward to working with you again in the near future. Thank you. It was uh, wonderful. It's just that it's uh, 9 p.m. here, um, Eastern Standard Time. That's the only thing. But other than that, I think it was wonderful. Thank you so much for, for listening, and I hope this uh, webinar was informative. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Dr. Sarathan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending another great Oculus webinar. And uh, thank you, Dr. Srinivasan, for uh, 
being part of this webinar. We really appreciate that. Uh, please keep watching your emails and Oculus website for other educational webinars on different instruments and topics. This webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Oculus website very soon. The Oculus website is www.oculususa.com. Thank you very much and have a good day.